Government Communications Headquarters The Government Communications Headquarters, GCHQ, is an intelligence and security organization responsible for providing signals intelligence, SIGINT, and information assurance to the government and armed forces of the United Kingdom. Based in the Donut in the suburbs of Cheltenham, GCHQ is the responsibility of the country's Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, but it is not a part of the Foreign Office and its director ranks as a permanent secretary. GCHQ was originally established after the First World War as the Government Code and Cipher School, GC and CS, and was known under that name until 1946. During the Second World War, it was located at Bletchley Park where it was responsible for breaking of the German Enigma codes. There are two main components of the GCHQ, the Composite Signals Organization, CSO, which is responsible for gathering information, and the National Cyber Security Center, NCSC, which is responsible for securing the UK's own communications. The Joint Technical Language Service, JTLS is a small department and cross-government resource responsible for mainly technical language support and translation and interpreting services across government departments. It is co-located with GCHQ for administrative purposes. In 2013, GCHQ received considerable media attention when the former National Security Agency contractor Edward Snowden revealed that the agency wastes in the process of collecting all online and telephone data in the UK via the Timpora program. Snowden's revelations began a spate of ongoing disclosure soft global surveillance. The Guardian newspaper was then forced to destroy all incriminating files given to them by Snowden because of the threats of lawsuits from the UK government. GCHQ is led by the director of GCHQ, Jeremy Fleming, and a corporate board, made up of executive and non-executive directors. Reporting to the corporate board is During the First World War, the British Army and Royal Navy had separate signals intelligence agencies, MI-1B and NAD-25, initially known as Room 40, respectively. In 1919, the Cabinet Secret Service Committee, chaired by Lord Curzon, recommended that a peacetime code-breaking agency should be created, a task given to the Director of Naval Intelligence, Hugh Sinclair. Sinclair merged staff from NAD-25 and MI-1B into the new organization, which initially consisted of around 25 to 30 officers and a similar number of clerical staff. It was titled the Government Code and Cipher School, a cover name chosen by Victor Forbes off the Foreign Office. Alistair Denniston, who had been a member of NID-25, was appointed as its operational head. It was initially under the control of the Admiral Deanne located in Watergate House, Adelphi, London. Its public function was to advise as to the security of codes and ciphers used by all government departments and to assist in their provision, but also had a secret directive to study the methods of cipher communications used by foreign powers. GC and CS officially formed on November 1, 1919, and produced its first decrypt on 19 October. Before the Second World War, GC and CS was a relatively small department. By 1922, the main focus of GC and CS was on diplomatic traffic, with no service traffic ever worth circulating and so, at the initiative of Lord Curzon, it was transferred from the Admiralty to the Foreign Office. GC and CS came under the supervision of Hugh Sinclair, who by 1923 was both the Chief of CIS and Director of GC and CS. In 1925, both organizations were co-located in different floors of Broadway buildings, opposite St. James's Park. Messages decrypted by GC and CS were distributed in blue-jacketed files that became known as BJs. In the 1920s, GC and CS was successfully reading Soviet Union diplomatic ciphers. However, in May 1927, during a row over clandestine Soviet support for the general strike and the distribution of subversive propaganda, Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin made details from the decrypts public. During the Second World War, GC and CS was based largely at Bletchley Park, in present-day Milton Keynes, working on understanding the German Enigma machine and Lawrence ciphers. In 1940, GC and CS was working on the diplomatic codes and ciphers of 26 countries, tackling over 150 diplomatic crypto systems. Senior staff included Alistair Denniston, Oliver Strachey, Dilly Knox, John Tiltman, Edward Travis, Ernst Vetterlein, Josh Cooper, Donald Mitchie, Alan Turing, Gordon Welchman, Joan Clark, Max Newman, William Tutte, I, J, Jack, Good, Peter Calvocracy, and Hugh Foss. An outstation in the Far East, the Far East Combined Bureau was set up in Hong Kong in 1935, and moved to Singapore in 1939. Subsequently, 
with the Japanese advance down the Malay Peninsula, the Army and RAF codebreakers went to the Wireless Experimental Center in Delhi, India. The Navy codebreakers in Fikbi went to Colombo, Ceylon, then to Kilindini, near Mombasa, Kenya. GC and CS was renamed the Government Communications Headquarters in June 1946. GCHQ was at first based in East Coat, but in 1951 moved to the outskirts of Cheltenham, setting up two sites there, Oakley and Benal. Duncan Campbell and Mark Hosenball revealed the existence of GCHQ in 1976 in an article for Time Out, as a result, Hosenball was deported from the UK. GCHQ had a very low profile in the media until 1983 when the trial of Jeffrey Prime, a KGB mole within GCHQ, created considerable media interest. Since the days of the Second World War, U.S. and British intelligence have shared information. For the GCHQ this means that it shares information with, and gets information from, the National Security Agency, NSA, in the United States. In 1984, GCHQ was the center of a political row when the conservative government of Margaret Thatcher prohibited its employees from belonging to a trade union. It was claimed that joining a union would be in conflict with national security. A number of mass national one-day strikes were held to protest this decision, seen as a first step to wider bans on trade unions. Appeals to British courts and European Commission of Human Rights were unsuccessful. The government offered a sum of money to each employee who agreed to give up their union membership. Appeal to the ELO resulted in a decision that government's actions were in violation of freedom of association and protection of the right to organize convention. The ban was eventually lifted by the incoming Labour government in 1997, with the Government Communications Group of the Public and Commercial Services Union, PIECES, being formed to represent interested employees at all grades. In 2000, a group of 14 former GCHQ employees, who had been dismissed after refusing to give up their union membership, were offered re-employment, which three of them accepted. The Intelligence Services Act 1994 placed the activities of the intelligence agencies on a legal footing for the first time, defining their purpose, and the British Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee was given a remit to examine the expenditure, administration and policy of the three intelligence agencies. The objectives of GCHQ are defined as working as in the interests of national security, with particular reference to the defense and foreign policy of Her Majesty's government, in the interests of the economic well-being of the United Kingdom, and in support of the prevention and the detection of serious crime. During the introduction of the Intelligence Agency Act in late 1993, the former Prime Minister Jim Callaghan had described GCHQ as a full-blown bureaucracy adding that future bodies created to provide oversight of the intelligence agencies should investigate whether all the functions that GCHQ carries out today are still necessary. In 1993, in the wake of the Squishy Gate affair, GCHQ denied intercepting, recording or disclosing the telephone calls of the British royal family. In late 1993 civil servant Michael Quinlan advised a deep review of the work of GCHQ following the conclusion of his review of intelligence requirements and resources which had imposed a 3% cut on the agency. The Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Jonathan Aitken, subsequently held face-to-face -face discussions with the intelligence agency directors to assess further savings in the wake of Quinlan's review. Aldrich, 2010, suggests that Sir John Adai, the then director of CHQ performed badly in meetings with Aitken, leading Aitken to conclude that GCHQ was suffering from out-of-date methods of management and out-of-date methods for assessing priorities. GCHQ's budget was £850 million in 1993, pound as of, compared to £125 million for the Security Service and CIS, MI5 and MI6. In December 1994 the businessman Roger Hearn was commissioned to begin a review of GCHQ, which was concluded in March 1995. Hearn's report recommended a cut of £100 million in GCHQ's budget. Such a large reduction had not been suffered by any British intelligence agency since the end of World War II. The J Division of GCHQ, which had collected SIGINT on Russia, disappeared as a result of the cuts. The cuts had been mostly reversed by 2,000 inches the wake of threats from violent non-state actors, and risks from increased terrorism, organized crime and illegal access to nuclear, chemical and biological weapons. David Oman became the director of GCHQ in 1996 and greatly restructured the agency in the face of new and changing targets and rapid technological change. change.Omond introduced the concept of sinews, 
or SIGINT new systems, which allowed more flexible working methods, avoiding overlaps in work by creating 14 domains, each with a well-defined working scope. The tenure of Omond also saw the planning and the creation of the Donut, GCHQ's modern headquarters. Located on a 176-acre site in Benal, near Cheltenham, the Donut would be the largest building constructed for secret intelligence operations outside the United States. Operations at GCHQ's Chumham Kwok Listening Station in Hong Kong ended in 1994. GCHQ's Hong Kong operations were extremely important to their relationship with the NSA, who contributed investment and equipment to the station. In anticipation of the transfer of Hong Kong to the Chinese government in 1997, the Hong Kong station's operations were moved to Geraldton in Australia. Operations that used GCHQ's intelligence gathering capabilities in the 1990s included the monitoring of communications of Iraqi soldiers in the Gulf War, of dissident Republican terrorists and the real IRA, of the various factions involved in the Yugoslav Wars, and of the criminal Kenneth Noy. In the mid 1990s, GCHQ began to assist in the investigation of cybercrime. At the end of 2003, GCHQ moved to a new circular HQ popularly known as the Donut. At the time, it was the second-largest public sector building project in Europe, with an estimated cost of £337 million. The new building, which was designed by Gensler and constructed by Carillion, became the base for all of Cheltenham operations. The public spotlight fell on GCHQ in late 2003 and early 2004 following the sacking of Catherine Gunn after she leaked to the Observer a confidential email from agents at the United States National Security Agency addressed to GCHQ agents about the wiretapping of UN delegates in the run-up to the 2003 Iraq War. GCHQ gains its intelligence by monitoring a wide variety of communications and other electronic signals. For this, a number of stations have been established at in the UK and overseas. The listening stations are at Cheltenham itself, Bude, Scarborough, Ascension Island, and with the United States at Manweath Hill. AO's Nikolaus Station in Cyprus is run by the British Army for GCHQ. In March 2010, GCHQ was criticized by the Intelligence and Security Committee for problems with its IT security practices and failing to meet its targets for work targeted against cyber attacks. As revealed by Edward Snowden in The Guardian, GCHQ spied on foreign politicians visiting the 2009 G20 London summit by eavesdropping phone calls and emails and monitoring their computers, and in some cases even ongoing after the summit via keyloggers that had been installed during the summit. According to Edward Snowden, GCHQ has two principal umbrella programs for collecting communications. GCHQ also has had access to the U.S. Internet Monitoring Program PRISM since at least June 2010. PRISM is said to give the National Security Agency and FBI easy access to the systems of nine of the world's top Internet companies, including Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Yahoo, and Skype. In February 2014, The Guardian, based on documents provided by Snowden, revealed that GCHQ had indiscriminately collected 1.8 million private Yahoo webcam images from users across the world. In the same month NBC and The Intercept, based on documents released by Snowden, revealed the Joint Threat Research Intelligence Group and the CNE units within GCHQ. Their mission was cyber operations based on dirty tricks to shut down enemy communications, discredit, and plant misinformation on enemies. These operations were 5% of all GCHQ operations according to a conference slideshow presented by the GCHQ. Soon after becoming director of GCHQ in 2014, Robert Hannigan wrote an article in the Financial Times on the topic of Internet surveillance, stating that however much, large U.S. technology companies, may dislike it, they have become the command and control networks of choice for terrorists and criminals and that GCHQ and its sister agencies cannot tackle these challenges at scale without greater support from the private sector, arguing that most Internet users would be comfortable with a better and more sustainable relationship between the intelligence agencies and the tech companies. Since the 2013 global surveillance disclosures, large U.S. technology companies have improved security and become less cooperative with foreign intelligence agencies, including those of the U.K., generally requiring a U.S. court order before disclosing data. However the head of the U.K. technology industry group TechHook rejected these claims, stating that they understood the issues but that disclosure obligations must be based upon a clear and transparent legal framework and effective oversight rather than 
as suggested, a deal between the industry and government. In 2015, Documents obtained by The Intercept from U.S. National Security Agency whistleblower Edward Snowden revealed that GCHQ had carried out a mass surveillance operation, codenamed Karma Police, since about 2008. The Karma Police operation swept up the IP address of Internet users visiting websites. The program was established with no public scrutiny or oversight. Karma Police is a powerful spying tool in conjunction with other GCHQ programs, because IP addresses could be cross-referenced with other data. The goal of the program, according to the documents, was either, a, a web browsing profile for every visible user on the Internet, or, b, a user profile for every visible website on the Internet. In 2015, GCHQ admitted for the first time in court that it conducts computer hacking. In 2017, U.S. Press Secretary Sean Spicer alleged that GCHQ had conducted surveillance on U.S. President Donald Trump, basing the allegation on statements made by a media commentator during a Fox News segment. The U.S. government formally apologized for the allegations and promised they would not be repeated. However, surveillance of Russian agents did pick up contacts made by Trump's campaign team in the run up to his election, which was passed on to U.S. agencies. On October 31, 2018, GCHQ joined Instagram. As well as a mission to gather intelligence, GCHQ has for a long time had a corresponding mission to assist in the protection of the British government's own communications. When the Government Code and Cipher School, GCNCS, was created in 1919, its overt task was providing security advice. GCNC's security section was located in Mansfield College, Oxford during the Second World War. In April 1946, GCNCS became GCHQ, and the now GCHQ security section moved from Oxford to join the rest of the organization at East Goat later that year. From 1952 to 1954, the intelligence mission of GCHQ relocated to Cheltenham, the security section remained at East Goat, and in March 1954 became a separate, independent organization, the London Communications Security Agency, LCSA which in 1958 was renamed to the London Communications Electronic Security Agency, LSASA. In April 1965, GPO and MOD units merged with LSASA to become the Communications Electronic Security Department, CESD. In October 1969, CESD was merged into GCHQ and becoming Communications Electronic Security Group, CESG. In 1977 CESG relocated from East Coast to Cheltenham. CESP continued as the UK National Technical Authority for Information Assurance, including cryptography. CESC did not manufacture security equipment, but worked with industry to ensure the availability of suitable products and services, while GCHQ itself funded research into such areas, for example to the Centre for Quantum Computing at Oxford University and the Heilbronn Institute at the University of Bristol. In the 21st century, CESC ran a number of assurance schemes such as CHECK, CLOS, Commercial Product Assurance, CPA, and CESC Assisted Products Service CAPS. In late 1969 the concept for public key encryption was developed and proven by James H. Ellis, who had worked for CESC, and before it, CESD, since 1965. Ellis lacked the necessary number theory expertise necessary to build a workable system. Subsequently, a feasible implementation scheme via an asymmetric key algorithm was invented by another staff member Clifford Cox, a mathematics graduate. This fact was kept secret until 1997. In 2016, the National Cyber Security Centre was established under GCHQ, but located in London, as the UK's authority on cyber security. It absorbed and replaced SESG as well as activities that had previously existed outside GCHQ, the Centre for Cyber Assessment. CCA, Computer Emergency Response Team UK, CERT UK, and the Cyber-Related Responsibilities of the Centre for the Protection of National Infrastructure, CPNI. The Joint Technical Language Service, JTLS, was established in 1955, drawing on members of the Small Ministry of Defence Technical Language Team and others, initially to provide standard English translations for organisational expressions in any foreign language discover the correct English equivalents of technical terms in foreign languages and discover the correct expansions of abbreviations in any language. 
The remit of the JTLS has expanded in the ensuing years to cover technical language support and interpreting and translation services across the UK government and to local public sector services in Gloucestershire and surrounding counties. The JTLS also produces and publishes foreign language working aids under Crown Copyright and conducts research into machine translation and online dictionaries and glossaries. The JTLS is co-located with GCHQ for administrative purposes. GCHQ operates in partnership with equivalent agencies worldwide in a number of bilateral and multilateral relationships. The principal of these is with the United States, National Security Agency, Canada, Communications Security Establishment. Australia, Australian Signals Directorate, and New Zealand, Government Communications Security Bureau, through the mechanism of the UK-US Security Agreement, a broad intelligence sharing agreement encompassing a range of intelligence collection methods. Relationships are alleged to include shared collection methods, such as the system described in the popular media as Echelon, as well as analyzed products. GCHQ's legal basis is enshrined in the Intelligence Services Act 1994 Section 3 as follows. Activities that involve interception of communications are permitted under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000. This kind of interception can only be carried out after a warrant has been issued by a Secretary of State. The Human Rights Act 1998 requires the intelligence agencies, including GCHQ, to respect citizens' rights as described in the European Convention on Human Rights. The Prime Minister nominates cross-party members of Parliament to an Intelligence and Security Committee. The remit of the committee includes oversight of intelligence and security activities and reports are made directly to Parliament. Its functions were increased under the Justice and Security Act 2013 to provide for further access and investigatory powers. Judicial oversight of GCHQ's conduct is exercised by the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. The UK also has an Independent Intelligence Services Commissioner on Interception of Communications Commissioner, both of whom are former senior judges. The Investigatory Powers Tribunal ruled in December 2014 that GCHQ does not breach the European Convention of Human Rights, and that its activities are a compliant with Articles 8, Right to Privacy, and 10, Freedom of Expression of the European Convention of Human Rights. However, the tribunal stated in February 2015 that one particular aspect, the data sharing arrangement that allowed UK intelligence services to request data from the US surveillance programs PRISM and Upstream, had been in contravention of human rights law prior to this until two paragraphs of additional information, providing details about the procedures and safeguards, were disclosed to the public in December 2014. Furthermore, the IPT ruled that the legislative framework in the United Kingdom does not permit mass surveillance and that while GCHQ collects and analyzes data in bulk, it does not practice mass surveillance. This complements independent reports by the Interception of Communications Commissioner, and a special report made by the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament, although several shortcomings and potential improvements to both oversight and the legislative framework were highlighted. Despite the inherent secrecy around much of GCHQ's work, investigations carried out by the UK government after the Snowden disclosures have admitted various abuses by the security services. A report by the Intelligence and Security Committee, ISC, in 2015 revealed that a small number of staff at UK intelligence agencies had been found to misuse their surveillance powers, in one case leading to the dismissal of a member of staff at GCHQ although there were no laws in place at the time to make these abuses a criminal offense. Later that year, a ruling by the Investigatory Powers Tribunal found that GCHQ acted unlawfully in conducting surveillance on two human rights organizations. The closed hearing found the government in breach of its internal surveillance policies in accessing and retaining the communications of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights and the Legal Resources Center in South Africa. This was only the second time in the IPT's history that it had made a positive determination in favor of applicants after a closed session. At another IPT case in 2015, GCHQ conceded that from January 2010, the regime for the interception slash obtaining, analysis, use, disclosure and destruction of legally privileged material has not been in accordance with the law for the purposes of Article A2 of the European Convention on Human Rights and was accordingly unlawful. This admission was made in connection with a case brought against them by Abdel Hakim bel a Libyan opponent of the former Qadhafi regime, and his wife Fatima Bouchar. The couple accused British ministers and officials of participating in their unlawful abduction, 
kidnapping and removal to Libya in March 2004, while Qaddafi was still in power. In 2015 there was a complaint the Green Party MP Caroline Lucas that British intelligence services, including GCHQ, had been spying on MPs allegedly in defiance of laws prohibiting it. GCHQ had introduced a policy in March 2015 that did not require approval by the Prime Minister, or any minister, before deliberately targeting the communications of a parliamentarian. Then Home Secretary, Theresa May, had told Parliament in 2014 that the Investigatory Powers Tribunal investigated the complaint, and ruled that contrary to the allegation, there was no law that gave the communications off Parliament any special protection. The Wilson Doctrine merely acts as a political convention. A controversial GCHQ case determined the scope of judicial review of prerogative powers, the Crown's residual powers under common law. This was Council of Civil Service Unions v. Minister for the Civil Service, 1985, AC 374, often known simply as the GCHQ case. In this case, a prerogative order in council had been used by the Prime Minister, who is the Minister for the Civil Service, to ban trade union activities by civil servants working at GCHQ. This order was issued without consultation. The House of Lords had to decide whether this was reviewable by judicial review. It was held that executive action is not immune from judicial review simply because it uses powers derived from common law rather than statute, thus, the prerogative is reviewable. The following is a list of the heads of the operational heads of GCHQ and GC and CS. The following are the stations and former stations that continued to operate through the Cold War. The GCHQ Certified Training GCT, scheme was established to certify two main levels of cybersecurity training. There are also degree and master's level courses. These are The GCT scheme was designed to help organizations find the right training that also met GCHQ's exacting standards. It was designed to assure high quality cybersecurity training courses where the training provider had also undergone rigorous quality checks. The GCT process is carried out by APMG as the independent certification body. The scheme is part of the National Cybersecurity Program established by the government to develop knowledge, skills, and capability in all aspects of cybersecurity in the and is based on the ISP skills framework. The historical drama film The Imitation Game, 2014, featured Benedict Cumberbatch portraying Alan Turing's efforts to break the Enigma code while employed by the government code in cipher school. GCHQ units. GCHQ specifics. UK agencies. Elsewhere. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.